So good morning, good afternoon uh, to you all, uh, depending on, I guess, where you're located in the world. Just for reference, uh, Michael, my co-presenter, and myself are located here in Auckland, New Zealand. So it's uh, early morning for us, hence the reason we might look um, in the dark a little. Um, but uh, uh, welcome, everyone, and thank you for attending uh, this webinar on the psychology of internal communications. So my name's Philip Nunn, and I'm going to be one of your presentations uh, for the next 30 minutes or so. Uh, and I'm joined by Michael Hartland. Mike has been with Snapcoms for uh, around three years. He's a pretty seasoned internal communicator. communicator. Uh, his responsibilities at Snapcoms include pretty much all of our content creation. And I guess if you're a reader of our blogs or our newsletter, then you're sure to have come across uh, Mike's work before. So do you want to say hi, Mike? Yeah, uh, thanks, Phil. Hi, everyone. Thanks for thanks for joining us today. Nice to eat, meet you all. Um, just to return the favour to Phil, so uh, Philip Nunn, uh, he's the General Manager of Business at Snapcoms. Um, <clears throat> he's been with the company for oh, seven years or more, I think, so um, he's he's uh, extremely seasoned. Um, so Phil's a bit of a, a bit of a guru when it comes to internal communications and employee engagement. He's uh, he's worked with customers all over the world, all sorts of sectors, uh, and he regularly speaks at events like IABC and, uh, and events like that. So you may have seen him at IABC the last couple of years. Uh, so he's a man who knows what he's talking about. I'm uh, glad to be here with him today. <laughs> I like the way you said that I'm well seasoned, Mike. Thank you. Um, <laughs> all right, thank you. Um, and we've also got with us uh, a couple of our amazing customer success team. So today we've got uh, Beth and Sydney. I think many of you probably already know them, and they're always uh, here to help in, as best they can. Um, today they're going to be moderating the chat and the questions, uh, and ideally answering some of those questions as we go through. And, uh, and of course, you feel free to contact your customer success manager after this presentation if you've got further questions or comments and uh, do you just want to say a quick hello Beth and Sydney? Hi. Hello. Hi thanks both. All right now before we get into it uh, just some housekeeping uh, we're going to record this session everyone's muted but uh, but feel free to ask questions through the um, chat uh, portal. Uh, we're going to pause at certain points throughout the session uh, in order to answer any of those questions that have been asked. And I think we'll also hopefully have some time at the end of the presentation for further Q&A. And on that, we think that the, if you like, the presentation side of things is going to be around 30 minutes, um, after which uh, I'm going to try and uh, jump into my content, Snapcoms environment, content manager, and hopefully show you some practical examples of what we're talking about. Um, so without further ado, uh, let's get started. Uh, just, just before we start, I know that um, Mike and I can kind of get carried away here and start to talk quite quickly. So if, we, if at any point you think that we're moving too quickly or too fast, then just um, put a note in the window. And Beth, uh, Sydney, if that is the case, then just um, then just let us know and uh, we will slow down. Anyhow, firstly, an example. Uh, I think we've probably all been in this scenario from time to time. You know, we're launching a new tool, uh, a process or some system. We're all excited, we're pretty fired up. Uh, you've had an all-staff meeting, you've sent an email around to everyone, but actually no one's really that engaged. Um, they're confused, they're not, they're not potentially getting your message, and they're not reading your email, and they're actually probably more likely to be thinking about something uh, which is a bit more uh, pleasurable, like uh, lunch, for example. I don't know if that's a familiar story, but um, this, this kind of example highlights an, an unexpected and an often undesired employee response to a business communication. So this communication is important to you as a communicator, but but I guess this is the same for every other department that we that we interface with. So HR, IT, marketing, in fact, any business function, they've all got important messaging. So why why do some messages get through and not others, and why why are some more successful? And if we knew this, how could we change our way of messaging to ensure that every message that we send is successful? Well. Turns out that it really is all in the mind. And in this presentation, we're going to share six insights from psychology that influence employee behavior, start to look at the implications for internal communications, and then suggest recommendations for how you can take advantage of these in your workplace. So our first insight really is around environmental influence. And people are, are hugely influenced, influenced by things that they see around them, often without realizing it. And the stimuli of a word or a picture can continue to influence uh, long after being exposed to it. And there's a pretty famous example I'm going to use to, to help illustrate this. Now, hopefully, some of you are familiar with Darren Brown. Uh, he's an English illusionist or, or, or mentalist, I think they now call him. 
I don't know if that's a positive or negative connotation, but anyway, um, he's well known for getting people to kind of act in outlandish or uncommon ways. And he, he achieves this through a concept called message conditioning. And he manipulates environmental aspects to influence people's behavior. And he does this by purposely using visual cues, such as street signs, clothing, displays, billboards, all these types of things. Now there's a, there's a great, great, really great video on YouTube that uh, illustrates this. And the link, the link to this video will be shared uh, in the information pack uh, following this presentation for anyone that wants to watch it. But effectively, the story here is that two advertising executives are asked to pitch a concept for an animal afterlife company. Now the center pick that you see on the slide here is Darren comparing what he drew beforehand uh, to the pitch that the executives came up with. And they're actually almost identical. Darren drew out a stuffed bear playing a harp, sitting on a cloud in front of some heavenly zoo gates. And he called this company Creature Heaven. Now the advertising executives called their company Animal Heaven, but they also pitched a stuffed bear playing a harp on a cloud in front of heavenly zoo gates. It was almost identical to what Darren had drew beforehand, but which they'd actually got no prior knowledge of. And Darren had constructed visual cues that the advertising executive subconsciously absorbed. Now, around the main pick here on the slide, you can see screen grabs from a very carefully controlled uh, a cab ride that the executives took around the city of London in this case. They passed a coffee shop that was called Creature Heaven. Uh, they passed a group of school children wearing sweatshirts with zoo gates on them. They actually go past London Zoo and so on and so forth. But all of these were purposely planted visual cues by Darren in order to influence the thinking of the two executives. So, so why, why does this actually work? And there's a concept in psychology uh, called priming. And it refers to visual cues that prime people uh, to act in a particular way. So if you're into DIY, uh, think of the primer that you put onto a bare metal or a piece of wood. And if you're into makeup, uh, then I'm, I'm told that you should add a base primer. And effectively, this is the thing that goes on first and prepares that base layer for the main material that goes on top and allows better adhesion and better durability. So how can we relate this to the workplace? Well, priming can teach us that employees will respond to, employ uh, to internal communications basically based on how they've been influenced. <clears throat> Excuse me. We can use visual cues that will prime employees to act in a, in a particular way. And their willingness to engage is largely dependent in part on whether they've been suitably primed or not. And if we get repeated exposure to these cues, we can start to modify uh, any underlying assumptions that the employees may hold, and, and we can thus start to drive uh, behavioral change. So practically, how can we make use of priming? Well, we could use teaser material before the launch of a new tool, a process, or a campaign. And if you think of visuals like posters or, or written uh, communications, so snippets in a newsletter, for example. <clears throat> um, but for big workplace announcements, like a restructure or a corporate announcement, we can use signposting campaigns to refer in advance to the situation that's going to cause the change. But it's, it, the whole point here is it's about increasing employees' familiarity with the subject, priming them. And this priming allows employees to be just much more receptive. There's less of a surprise when events happen which in turn makes them more accepting of the uh, changes, the impending changes. Now, the second insight that I want to share uh, is to avoid cognitive strain. And it just turns out that humans are hardwired to avoid things that are, that are hard to understand. If our brains need to work hard to extract the meaning of something, we tend to give up and we start thinking of something a little less taxing. So as communicators, we should really always be trying to avoid that, that cognitive strain. Now, these examples of iconography are absolutely instantly recognizable. They're very simple, but they're very rich in their content, and they make complicated messaging understood easily. So just think of them as mental shortcuts. They, have, they avoid the need for your brain to think. We know what they are before, before we need to have any more context. <clears throat> in psychology, uh, this concept is called salience. And People pay attention to things that appear easy and accessible. And for internal communicators, this means creating communications that are personally relevant and easy to digest versus messaging that is lengthy, very technical in detail, or irrelevant to the target audience. Remember, we want to just avoid that cognitive strain. 
So again, tying this back to the workplace, um, put simply, employees respond faster to messaging that is easy and accessible. Research uh, tells us that messages that are presented consistently are up to four times more likely to be recognized by staff. So think of it as a, as a mental shortcut. People also prefer things that they're familiar with and being familiar with something increases their likelihood of taking action around it. But conversely, unfamiliarity just brings effort. So here's a, here's a pretty common example. Uh, it's an all staff update and it's coming from the human resource team. It's always presented bottom left. It always has the same logo and symbol. It's always got the same color, you know, things like that. Uh, but because it's presented in this consistent manner, employees recognize the message much, fast, much faster, they're more familiar with it, and they're more likely to read and act upon it. And now here's another example, which I guess we're all now pretty familiar with, so Teams, um, always presents bottom right, it's always the same color, layout, etc. But it's this consistency in appearance that increases the familiarity and our likelihood to engage. Now, um, I've spoken for probably long enough for the time being, so I'm gonna hand across to Mike just to take us through um, the next few insights. Um, but before I do that, I just wanted to have a quick pause and see if there are any questions that have come in from the audience. Uh, Beth and Sydney. Yeah, so we have two questions so far. Um, the first one is, when it comes to priming, have you seen a workflow using your tool and, and other tools um, that can lead to greater impact? Hmm. Uh, yeah, uh, well, anything really around campaigns. So this sustained um, sustained um, um, messaging, if you like, on a particular subject. So um, screensavers, digital signage, wallpapers, lock screens, really great for that type of thing. And um, these are really all about education. So though anything you're looking to educate your audience around, they're a great um, example for um, how you could use priming. Okay, and then we have um, another one. Do you have any examples of using symbols to avoid cognitive strain and, and how effective they can be? Um, uh, yes, is a short answer. Um, we, we're probably going to run through a few at the end of the, at the end of this session anyway. Um, but a, but a, a, an obvious one is kind of IT outages. Um, so you get a red exclamation mark with a, a bold outline kind of signifies that there's a there's a, a an alert or, or danger if you like um, uh, things like padlocks signify cyber security they're all around us actually and um, when you start to look at them you realize just how many of these things were actually influenced by uh, but we'll take a look specifically at some of those as we go through the um, the demo at the end of this session All right, um, no further questions. I'm going to um, hand across to Mike. Thank you, Phil. <clears throat> Excuse me. So insight three is around uh, liking what's popular uh, and how actually how this is not just a uh, not just a superficial thing, uh, but actually turns out it's quite an important survival mechanism for us. So it's no secret that we all like opinions that match our own. We feel secure with them. They bolster our confidence. They reduce our feelings of tension and frustration. For example, think about the way that you use the internet. You're reading reviews online for somewhere you've just stayed on holiday, or maybe you're browsing a public forum about an event which has just happened in the news. When you're doing this, do you find yourself gravitating towards those posts which mirror the way you feel and reflect the opinions that you already have? I'm sure you do because it's only natural to do it, and I find myself doing it all the time as well. But it turns out the way that we unconsciously seek out these like-minded opinions, it's more than just superficial, it's actually an important survival mechanism for humans. But to find out why, we have to take a quick trip back in time for a moment. Okay, so I haven't just snuck in one of my uh, photos from my family photo album here. This is, um, this is actually a scene from, uh, from our caveman days. Uh, back in the days when tablets were made of stone rather than shiny metal and plastic, uh, and when clubs were used for hunting rather than for dancing in. As humans, we've survived because of our ability to band together. The cavemen ancestors that we had who formed groups were the ones who were much more likely to survive. Those who distanced themselves from the group tended not to last very long without the support of the group. And that's because being part of the group or following the crowd allowed us to function in complicated and fast changing environments. And that's as true in today's digital workplaces as it was in the prehistoric past. And since those days, social psychology has shown us something quite interesting. It's shown us that like-minded people reinforce one another's viewpoints. 
the beliefs we hold are strengthened when we're around other people who hold similar views. And a great example of this is advertising campaigns. You've probably seen some of these uh, types of images like you can see on screen at the moment. Um, next time you're watching television uh, in the evenings and the commercials come on, don't just leave the room to make a cup of coffee or, or just ignore the ads. Take a look at the type of language that they're using in there. You will have seen some of these, I'm sure. The most popular, fastest growing, best selling. The advertisers aren't trying to persuade us that their product is any good, only that other people think so. They're playing on the fact that popular is good and that's what helps them sell products. But what does this mean for employee communications? Well, as people, we inherently trust our peers more than we trust officials. And as communicators, we can all use this to our advantage. The next time you're planning a campaign, maybe to launch a new promotion or kick off a new business transformation project, identify the key influencers and thought leaders amongst your employees whose opinion is trusted and is sought by others. And then once you've found these people, target messages specifically to them and involve them in your campaigns early, ideally in the very earliest planning stages. By doing this, these employees can then become valuable change agents who can help to convert others, that is to uh, encourage others to, to come on board, react and respond the way you want. Uh, just go back up a slide, Phil, please. Um, thank you. Uh, just a, one more quick point to, uh, to make on this. Uh, another good idea with this is to introduce online employee discussion forums uh, or to make use of them a bit more widely if you already have them set up. Uh, because while these uh, discussion forums can sometimes be used to spread uh, negative messages or inaccurate information, they're also a very valuable way of identifying these key influences if you haven't been able to identify them in, in any other way. And how can you find these people? Well, they'll be the ones who are commenting most frequently, their opinions are being asked for, and they're receiving lots of thumbs up reactions uh, from their peers. So getting these people on involved and on your side early is a great way to leverage the power of popularity to improve your communications effectiveness. Okay, insight four. This is around emotional resonance and how uh, messages are much more effective if there is an emotional stimuli attached to them. Uh, so to start off, think of a movie, book or song that you love, uh, one of your favourites, one of the ones that you know inside out, you regularly watch, listen to, read every year. Uh, I know for me this is the, the Shawshank Redemption for example, uh, I know for Phil it's quite partial to love actually. Um, chances are the uh, the reason this is one of your favourites, it actually isn't, I'm, I'm just giving him a, a dig there. I don't, I, don't, I don't mind it. No I don't either to be fair. Uh, chances are these books, movies or songs or whatever are one of your favourites because you feel emotionally connected to them somehow. And that might be because of the lyrical content, it could be a narrative theme, it could even be the person that you experience it with. And it's this that forms your connection with the book, movie or song or whatever at a deeper level. And that's because we as humans tend to remember things more strongly and more vividly if they have emotional resonance. But let's try another example though. So here's an example of a message with emotional resonance and a big scary dog on it as well. How does this message make you feel? Does it make you likely to take action after you've seen it? Would you still be willing to knock on the door of the house which has this sign on it to deliver some, some mail <clears throat> or ask to borrow some gardening tools? Probably not, right? Messages like this are effective because they trigger an emotion, in this case fear. There's no way you're going to knock on the door of that house unless you happen to know that the big scary dog is actually just a friendly little poodle. But let's look at another example as well, which also plays on emotional resonance and also coincidentally has a couple of dogs in it. Now these are a couple of stills from uh, reasonably well-known toilet paper commercials from a few years back. Uh, the top one is from the UK and the bottom one is from the US. So these ads trigger our feelings of love and security. We feel love for the cute puppy, so by extension we believe that the toilet paper must be pretty soft and lovely too. And studies have shown how experiences with emotional stimuli are much more effective at engaging us than non-emotional stimuli. We devote more of our attention to them, we remember them more vividly and more accurately, <clears throat> and perhaps more importantly, we can recall the details much more easily over time. And what does psychology tell us about this and how can we bring this into the workplace? Well, psychologists refer to something called effective events theory, and this states that our emotions act as filters through which events shape our attitudes and behaviour. Now this can be in the home, like when we're watching a cute toilet paper commercial, or it can be at work. 
What it means in the workplace is that we tend to react to situations in a certain way due to the emotional resonance from similar situations in the past. What do we mean by this? We mean if we had a positive experience with something previously, being exposed to something later that reminds us of the previous experience can promote a similar positive feeling. And the same is true of negative experiences. A negative experience in the past can make us feel negatively about something later if a stimuli um, attaches itself to it. So consider change communications for an example. Every organization around the world, sorry Phil, back up again one. Thank you, pardon. Uh, change communications, yes. Every organization around the world has gone through a huge amount of change this year. But employee messaging, which conveys empathy, solidarity, and support from leaders, will make the period of change much smoother for everyone. And equally as important, it means that when the next change comes, and if 2020 has shown us anything at all this year, it's that more change probably will be coming, it means employees will be more accepting of it and less resistant to it. And one of the best ways of tapping into emotional resonance for employee communications is storytelling. Now, this is a great way of bringing even the driest of subject matters to life. So research from Stanford University has shown that stories are up to 22 times more memorable than facts alone. So when you use data and stories together, your audience is being engaged on both an intellectual level and an emotional level. And the easiest way of doing this is by making real people the focus of your messages. For example, your story isn't about your organization's commitment to staff development and personal growth. It's about how amazing the experience has been for Steve in accounts, how, uh, how much he's achieved, how much he's grown, how much he's enjoyed the experience. When telling a story, you're taking listeners on a journey, moving them from one perspective to another. So by using storytelling in your employee communications, you can make the scenarios you're talking about feel more real, more tangible, and that encourages employees to buy into the message and to come along for the ride. So for communicators, or for all of us as communicators, this area of emotional resonance and storytelling is a ripe area to exploit for improving message cut through. When planning your campaigns, when constructing your messages, consider the emotional element of the words that you're using and the visuals you're showing. Think about what the message means at a personal level, not just a business level. And this is even more important if your campaign is about uh, a sensitive subject or if it's delivering bad news. Remember, communications that target the heart as well as the mind are much more likely to generate the response you want from staff. Okay, insight five. This is about the uh, the appeal of positive versus negative news and how both are, have appeals to us, but for very different reasons. So we all love a nice positive story, right? Well, it turns mm -hmm. out the answer is actually yes and no. As humans, we're attracted to both positive messages and negative messages for very different reasons. And this is something which is also true in the workplace. And it's something we as internal communicators need to take notice of. So first off though, let's take a look at the appeal of positive messages. So you're probably familiar with Pavlov's dogs, uh, and these four graphics you can see on screen here are, are four sort of summaries of, uh, of stages of this experiment. Uh, but in a nutshell, this was a famous study by Russian psychologist Ivan Pavlov. Now he noticed how the presence of a bowl of dog food triggered an unconditioned response in his dogs. They started to drawl or salivate. The, he then used a bell as a neutral stimulus, and there's no drawling, no salivating. Next he rang the bell as he gave the food to the dogs. And then finally he rang the bell on its own without providing any food to the dogs. And the dogs continued to drool or salivate but without the presence of food. Pavlov had demonstrated how the dogs had become conditioned to respond a certain way because of their desire for something pleasurable. In this case to eat some yummy dog treats. And it's a similar principle in humans where positive messaging can be used to appeal to our psychological desire for pleasure. But the full story is actually more complicated but much more interesting than that. Negative messaging or bad news also has an innate appeal to us. And there was an experiment done at McGill University in Canada which illustrates this nicely. Participants were asked to join a study about news but they weren't told what the purpose of the study was. Uh, when asked at the beginning of the study, participants claimed they preferred stories about good news. They said they felt the media was far too focused on negative stories. And then during the study, participants were observed interacting with a news website where all of the pieces of content that they engaged with were tracked. 
and the results showed that participants more often chose to read stories with a negative tone about governmental cor uh, corruption, about setbacks, about hypocrisy and so on, rather than the neutral or positive stories that they claimed they liked. It's evidence of what psychologists call a negativity bias, our desire to hear and remember bad news. So remember the caveman days we were talking about just before? Psychologists believe that this is due to humans being wired to react quickly to bad news to avoid potential danger. So there's a concept in psychology called inattentional blindness. <clears throat> and this describes how we fail to notice something obvious but unexpected because our attention is devoted on something else. And for us in our everyday lives, what this means is being fixated on headlines and missing the details. And in the workplace as well, there are lessons we can learn from this when communicating with our employees. Firstly, <clears throat> we can improve the adoption of positive behavioural change. If employees are consistently shown both the negative consequences of non-compliance, such as a loss of status in the workplace, and the positive consequences of compliance, like greater social approval, higher personal satisfaction levels, they'll automatically begin to associate pain with non-compliance and pleasure with compliance. So drawing these consequences out clearly in our messaging is how to get employees past the attention-grabbing headline and to actually understand the message and to respond appropriately. We can also use this to minimise the impact of delivering bad news. In times like this, inattentional blindness means that employees will only notice the headline, headline and they'll miss all of the important detail inside the message. So to counter this, it's important to communicate often to reinforce key messages, even if, you, even if you feel like there's not that much new to report. And keep track of when employees have last heard from you. This will give you a good cadence of when you need to reach out to them again. So by doing all of this, it can raise staff awareness of the details, inform them of the evolving situation, and most importantly, involve them all in the resolution. So that's the, uh, that's the end of Insight 5. So uh, I'll be handing back to Phil in a sec to, uh, to handle the sixth and final insight. Um, but maybe this is a good, uh, good, pause, uh, a good moment to pause to, to check to see whether there's any, any questions that have been raised by anybody in the last uh, 15 minutes. Uh, yes, we have some. So the first one I have here is how can we convey a sense of popularity or make something go viral in internal comms? All right. <clears throat> yes, I, I understand the appeal of that well. Um, uh, writing for a living and trying to get my uh, my content all over the uh, the internet, uh, I understand the appeal of, of popularity and, and having things go viral. I think I think there's a, there's, a, there's a few ways of doing it. Um, I think interactivity is, is always good. Um, so using quizzes and things might seem an obvious an obvious mechanism, but um, that they are great, particularly if you can hook in the ability to share your results with uh, the wider employees. Uh, so if I if I happen to do a quiz and know I got nine out of ten for it, and I know Phil only got six out of ten, uh, I'm probably going to share that as widely as I can. Um, so I think that that's one thing. Um, I think asking employees to contribute is good as well. I think employees like to see their peers contributing and that can help them uh, be more willing to share content more widely. Um, and also uh, take a leaf out of the social media uh, book and, and include uh, thumbs up reactions um, and those sort of things uh, because uh, seeing those numbers tick up is a great endorsement of the popularity of content, not, not just for the content creators but for everyone who's reading it as well. All right, and then we have a, another question here. With Snapcom's alerts or tickers, we tend to keep our messages um, shorter so they are easier to read. How would you recommend we weave a story in less than 200 characters? Yeah, uh, yeah, that, that would certainly be a challenge. Um, I, I think probably in the first case, uh, it's probably worth considering whether the, the channel that you're using is, is right for storytelling, because while some certainly are, um, yeah, some probably best suited for other, other types of messages. But um, I, I think in a nutshell, probably you shouldn't feel like you need to have the, uh, the whole message uh, or the whole story given away in your, your initial message or notification. Um, I think maybe it's sort of a, approach it like a teaser, like it's a, like it's a movie trailer. Uh, the, the content you put in your notification could just be something to whet the appetite to set the scene uh, and then include a link through to your uh, your intranet or another um, online platform where you have the whole story and we'll show the whole the whole movie as it were uh, so I think maybe just treat it a bit like a like a teaser to whet the appetite more than to give the whole story away 
Okay, uh, if those are all the questions we have, in that case, uh, we'll, uh, we'll keep it moving. Awesome, thank you. Uh, we'll pass it back to Phil for Insight 6. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mike. Thank you, Beth, for the questions. Um, so the sixth and the, the last insight that we're going to share today is really this, this whole concept of attention management. And we're living in a world of, of kind of ever, dis, ever increasing distraction. So there's a real competition for our attention. And, and the, I have to write this down. I've, I've, I've tried to memorize this and um, I've, I've failed in every time, I think. So let me read this and I'll re read it a couple of times. So the attention that we give to things uh, leads to the experiences that we have. Uh, the experience that we have determine the lives that we lead. So to lead the lives that we want, we need to control what we give attention to. And that's the whole concept of attention management. And I, I will read that again. <laughs> so the, uh, the attention that we give to things leads to the experiences that we have and the experiences that we have determine the lives that we lead. So to lead the lives that we want, we need to control what we give our attention to. And so this is the concept of attention management. So hopefully that makes sense. Kind of takes a little bit to get your head around it. Um, but look, here's a typical day in the office or, or at home, as perhaps more likely at the moment. Uh, there's perhaps less office distraction, but uh, uh, Teams and Slack and email are all still competing for our attention. And we know it can take kind of 10 to 20 times duration of the interruption to get back on track. Uh, the information, <coughs> excuse me, the information overload group estimates that 28% of an average workday is eaten by information overload. Uh, overload. And an attention management is a deliberate attempt by individuals to get that to get that control back in the, in their day, and that all that equates to eight hours per employee per week. So these distractions and information overload uh, cause an individual to have this sense of a loss of control. And as I said, the attention management is really that deliberate attempt to to wrestle that control back. Now, um, obviously, this is a bit of a problem for internal communicators. You know, staff are being selective, but well, what guarantee do we have that ensures those important messages, and I guess all messages are important, but anyway, those important messages are being seen, they're being understood, they're being acted upon. But the answer, unfortunately, there isn't any guarantees. Uh, just the ease of sending messages mean more messages, too many of them, are being sent, which decreases the effectiveness of all of them. And it's even more challenging when you start to add in, you know, other departments. They're all communicating. Uh, for attention using pretty much the same tools as, as you guys are. So <clears throat> overcoming attention management is really only possible through improving the relevance of your content and how it's being delivered and targeting relevant content that helps staff do their jobs at the right time via a channel that suits them is key to getting your messages read. So multi-channel communications work because it aligns your content with the channel that's best suited to deliver it. So, for example, email is absolutely fine for you know pretty lengthy business updates, but it's a terrible medium for critical, time-sensitive communications. But by using a multi-channel communications platform, you can maximise the best attributes of each channel, but minimise any weaknesses. And so, we've actually come up with some uh, with a concept called the communication spectrum, and hopefully some of you have seen this before. But we use this to plot how an organisation communicates. And we know we've got a range of different communications across a typical business enterprise with quite different messaging needs. But understanding this spectrum has been pretty essential for us in constructing ways in which we can help organizations communicate much more effectively. And having a balanced communication landscape that uses multiple means of communicating with its staff, <clears throat> depending on the intended outcome, really helps to drive staff engagement. So if you look on the screen here, we've got uh, a spectrum that ranges on the left hand side to very critical, uh, for example, emergency or urgent communication across to more social information. So uh, workplace culture, well-being content. And there's some some definitions of, you know, um, the uh, urgency in terms of being able to read it. So for an example, on the left side, it's I need I need I need to read this now to be safe. Whereas on the converse on the right hand side, I'll, I'm going to read this if it interests me and if I've got time. And then you've got everything else in the middle. And then there's just some examples of, of those the types of communications that they could be underneath. But this isn't this isn't a um, uh, this isn't the uh, something that is set in stone. I mean, this does vary from organisation to organisation. But to finish off that spectrum, we've kind of juxtaposed how the Snapcoms channels uh, actually fit in this spectrum, so you can relate your actual communication needs to a channel that can help you meet them. So we've got alerts and tickers, which tend to be 
more attention grabbing, more bound to something that's time based. But they're pretty versatile, so you can you can use them across. Well, you can use them with different configurations across pretty much the, the full spectrum. But if you follow that through with other modalities such as screensavers, quizzes, surveys, uh, newsletters, lock screens, wallpapers, and so on, you can start to see that these 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 varying uh, different delivery methods can enable you to fulfil a pretty wide array of your communication needs. Now, obviously, we know that Snapcoms is unlikely to be the only communication platform that you use within your organisation. Um, so what we've tried to do here is to be a little objective and uh, plot how other communication tools fit across that spectrum. And I appreciate this is somewhat subjective, uh, but we've really tried to look at the strengths of those platforms to see where they're best suited. Now, obviously, we feel that Snapcoms has got great coverage across the full spectrum because we've got that great diversity of channels. But I think it's 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 worth considering that of the tools and platforms that you have within your organization, you know, how are they being used? What's the communications outcomes you're expecting? And does that actually align to this spectrum? Are you, are you using the right tool for the right messaging? And does that achieve the uh, the outcomes that you need? So just to, just to summarize before we um, have a look at some practical examples, I know we've gone through quite a lot here. And again, you will get a copy of this presentation. But we've looked at insights into psychological concepts, some examples of how we can relate these to the workplace, as well as how we can potentially use these to our advantage as internal communicators. So firstly, we talked about priming and how contextual or visual cues can condition employee responses. So remember Darren Brown and how he influenced the advertising executives campaign just by manipulating the environment around them. And, and, and incidentally, if you haven't watched that clip or Darren, well, or Darren Brown in general, I definitely encourage you to do so. He's a pretty interesting character with some uh, quite interesting uh, experiments. But the second insight that we shared was really all about avoiding this cognitive strain, the using of mental shortcuts to help the brain just process that messaging faster and making sure that we make our messaging easy and accessible versus difficult to digest and detail, or, or worse, even irrelevant to the target audience. Now, thirdly, we touched upon uh, how our cohorts uh, can influence far more so than officials. And the comfort and, and support of peers, uh, knowing and being able to harness this can really help when we start to introduce change to an organization, for example. Now, the fourth insight um, was all about emotional resonance um, and how if we use emotion in our communications, uh, it can really help us to get that message cut through. Um, and emotional resonance means that messaging is just more likely to get attention and to have a much deeper, uh, stronger connection with the individual. So if, if you call your favorite movie, Mike, I think was a Shawshank Redemption and um, apparently mine was um, Love Actually. So we'll have to change the examples for next time. <laughs> um, uh, but we then talked about um, as, as humans, uh, we all love a good and a negative story. And the fact that when we receive when receiving bad news, <clears throat> we tend to fixate on the headline, not necessarily the detail. We also talked about how reinforcing a positive compliance can appeal to our uh, innate psychological desire for pleasure, as well as keeping a regular drumbeat of communication to ensure employees see past the headline and we limit what we call that inattentional blindness. <clears throat> and our last insight, which I just shared really, was all about how as humans we're all managing our attention, whether we're doing this consciously or subconsciously. We talked about how we can avoid messages getting lost in the general swirl of workplace communications and how using a multi-channel communications platform can really help to ensure that the right message is delivered to the right employee in the right way at the right time. So hopefully that uh, is a, as an accurate a reflection of what we, we talked about. So what I'm going to do now, um, how are we doing for time? We've got um, well, 40 minutes, so we've got a little bit of time left. So I'm going to um, jump out of this presentation and I'm going to um, start up my content manager. But before I do that, I need to um, turn off my webcam because unfortunately I need to move my laptop to be able to access my screen. So just um, bear with me for a second. So hopefully you can um, see my content manager. Yeah, you Mike, can. can you confirm? Yeah, yeah good. Thank I you can. very much. Um, and I think we've got a kind of a combination of, um, of both uh, customers and, and, and individuals who aren't customers. Hopefully they will become customers on the call. So just a, a little bit of an orientation here. Um, <clears throat> this is the what we call our Snapcoms content manager. This is where we create all our content. It's where uh, effectively your admins will log in. 
um, uh, I say create messaging, it's where you do all your administration, you get all of your reports, uh, you can see who's been reading things, etc., etc. So this is an online um, portal that you guys log into, and um, you can start to create your content, etc. And we try we try and make this as pretty easy as possible. So we've got some nice big buttons that kind of help uh, orientate people as to what it is they're trying to do. But that's only half the story of Snapcoms. The other half, uh, and hopefully you can um, see my app. Um, this is my Snapcoms app, and uh, this is, I've actually just moved that around just so I could see it a little bit easier, but it normally would appear on the bottom right of your screen. And it's this is in my taskbar. Um, and so employees can access that Snapcoms app uh, anytime they want, and they can re-access messaging that's been sent to them, uh, assuming it's, it hasn't expired. So th those are the two elements to Snapcoms. Um, but I'm just going to close that down here. All right, so just um, I've got some content that I've actually pre-created. Uh, so I didn't have to go through and, uh, and create all of this content from scratch. Um, but I just wanted to try and, I guess, give some practical examples of how you would use that. So you can see I've got some here that relate to priming, some positive reinforcements. Actually, let me just um, refresh the, um, the view of that. So priming, hopefully that goes in the order that we talked about them. Um, avoiding cognitive strain, um, salience, so liking what's popular. And then at the end of this, I'm going to try and, well, we'll go and create some content from scratch so you can just see how how easy it is to, to create some of these content using using our new use cases. But um, well, let's take a look at an example of something that we could use for priming. So remember this was how we, um, you know, we apply a base layer so people are more receptive to learning, et cetera. So in this case, <clears throat> I've, um, I'm using a screensaver. We've talked about screensavers being a good example of, of you know, educational campaigns and so on. And this one here is it obviously you, you would publish this uh, and it helps to build um, uh, it helps to build a layer upon which you can start to talk more about cybersecurity. So trying to reinforce that behavior, et cetera. So we feel that screensavers, and particularly around the subjects of things like cybersecurity, where you're trying to, to maintain, if you like, a, um, a, a certain level of understanding um, around a particular topic. Screensavers, lock screen, wallpapers, those types of things work very well uh, in these environments. So uh, let me just um, go back to, I just need to move a few windows around. Just stay with me for a second. Um, go to webinar is great, but it does fill your screen with lots of things that are potentially unnecessary. Um, so let me go back to uh, the folder that I was just in. <clears throat> and so the second one here is quite interesting, quite easy one, right? So I think we talked about this a little bit. So how we can use iconography around, um, uh, you know, making sure that people understand these before they even, uh, before they even um, really consume the message. So this is really all about a system outage. And I'll just I'll just use a preview to show this uh, this function. Uh, hopefully um, you guys are familiar with our preview. It's a great way of understanding, um, you know, whether your uh, content is hitting the mark in terms of what your intention is. So this is an IT outage, and you'll see that actually we we for us this is Snapcoms actually we put all of our um, service disruptions uh, at the top of the screen. Um, they always follow a certain pattern. They may be an alert, they may be a ticker, etc. But we can see that in this case. Uh, you know, people will start to understand that this message is, hey, an incident has started. And a lot of people use red for this. We just use orange because um, I guess the Snapcom's orange um, kind of suits our brand a little better, uh, etc. cetera. But, um, but conversely, when, you, when that incident is over, so when you go back to, uh, you want to send out a message that says that that particular uh, event has, has, has finished, then we would use this type of, um, this type of, alert to the to the audience and, and it's, it's a really easy way that people get it you know oh yeah yeah I've got it it's I understand uh, I, I know that, that we you know we've, we've got an issue an issue has started it may be that we deliver updates through that as well but you know hey what guess what this one's completed uh, so we've got a nice green tick tick again a tick is a good example of you know something is is positive and in this case we've said yep SharePoint's back online and okay got it so I, I really know without reading this message what these things are around so that, that, that hopefully those are good examples um, that we're that we're sharing uh, let's go back and have a look at some more what else have we got in here um, so here's a, here's a nice one that I like to, to go. So everybody likes to see that new employees are being hired. So this is, I guess this comes back to kind of liking what's popular. Um, and, you know, a peer, it kind of alludes to the, the, the peer and, um, you know, having having the ability for your peers to, to um, 
uh, to uh, provide reactions, etc. So this is again one of our use cases. Uh, in this case, we're introducing Alicia. She's one of our customer success managers. She's, she's actually not on the call today, but um, it's a great photo. So um, we we tend to use this one quite well. <laughs> um, and if you do, if you don't know Alicia, it's actually worth reading this. She's uh, she's got a degree in fine arts, and she's actually an opera singer, which is um, quite an interesting combination. Um, anyway, let me um, preview this uh, so you'll see how this um, this appears. And again, we're trying to to, to 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 do this message conditioning. So again, now we're using a. It's not an IT, for example, alert. This is uh, something that relates. It's a bit softer. It relates to people and culture. Uh, so in other words, it, it it sits in this area of the screen. So we again we're starting to build where where does by we're consuming these messages these messages almost um, subliminally based on where they're appearing in the um, in the particular uh, screen um, order. Okay, that's enough of Alicia. So let's go back and see what else we've got. Um, uh, hopefully these are making sense anyway. Um, uh, these these perhaps one a bit more um, perhaps one that's a little bit more. Um, uh, 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 if you think of that communication spectrum, so left being critical, right being social. Here's one that probably sits in the middle. So this is uh, this is actually a compliance message. Now everybody loves getting compliance messaging and compliance training, I'm sure. Um, so um, getting people's attention when it comes to these types of messaging can be quite difficult. I know from personal experience that what tends to happen is you get an initial email and then you get, uh, and let's just preview this one, you get an initial email and then you get another email, then you probably get an email from someone further up the chain uh, until it gets to the point where it's like, okay, you really need to sign this, etc. So, so this is an example of how we've, uh, we've used um, a direct on screen alert. Um, so in other words, this is something that we want people to take advantage of, uh, sorry, we want people to take notice of and they need to comply with this new work, in this case, working from home policy. In this case, we're kind of saying, okay, you can remind me later, but at some point we're going to have to have to do this uh, compliance. So, but making use of these channels is, is really the key to ensuring that you get uh, employees' attention and don't introduce uh, message fatigue. Okay, so I think what I'll do now, um, we've got a, a few minutes, well, we've got actually 10 minutes or so left. I'm just going to go and create uh, something from, from scratch here because um, I guess you can get the view of what we're talking about. So um, I'm going to take advantage of our use case templates. Uh, so hopefully some of you guys are familiar with that. And, and by the way, we're about to introduce a change to this screen. If we haven't done it already, I'm not sure how up to date my contact manager is, um, to make it much more easy to discover new uh, use cases because we're ending up at the moment with quite a long list of things and uh, we've, we've reworked that and we've made a change in terms of how, how accessible it is to, to individuals to, to get to some of these messages. So I'm going to look under my people and culture um, area and you can see I've now got a whole bunch of uh, people and culture um, use cases that I can see. As I roll over them you'll see that um, I get a, a little uh, icon to the right hand side that kind of talks about what it is but these are really intended for you to, to use without with minimal changes uh, so you can get about things, you can go about your day, you know, quickly and uh, and start to get things completed. So I'm going to use the uh, Employee of the Month uh, award. Uh, so I'm going to click on that's what I wanted it. That's what I want to create. I give it a theme. So I'll give it my Snapcoms theme. Uh, I need to give it a name. So let's call this uh, Mike. Mike, you're going to be oops, uh, Mike Employee if I can type. Um, and I'll just create my content. And one of the, one of the things that people, what actually our customers told us was, you know, get, you know, Snapcoms is great, but actually everyone's time poor. Uh, nobody really has a huge amount of time to spend on making great content. So what we've tried to do is take that pain away. So we've already um, made this kind of look pretty nice. So all you've got to do now, is, and we've, we've given some suggested text, but of course you can change that to be whatever you wish. And in this case, I'm just going to make a change. Uh, and make this to be, oops, um, let me just uh, go back to here. So this will be Mike, and it's his outstanding efforts. Uh, I'm not sure that you did any um, cloud migration, Mike, but anyway, um, let's, uh, <laughs> let's assume that you did. Um, and so, look, that's really easy for us to, to, to kind of um, to make that change. So. If I do a quick, uh, if I do a quick preview, uh, 
and then I'll publish it to my content manager so hopefully you can see that um, it will arrive. So again, this is a HR, people and culture type alert or message. So we put it on the bottom left of the screen, reinforcing that condition, etc. So yep, that looks like I, how I want it to appear. So I'll close the preview and I'll just give this a quick publish. Um, and with a bit of luck and a following wind, it will, uh, oh, I just want to send it to me. Oh, I haven't got any targets set. Hang on a second. I've got to do a few things here. So let's just send that to me. Um, apply. Uh, so yeah, you can see I've got my target set. I'm sending this for a month, but um, in reality, I'd probably, um, I'd probably, uh, well, actually, I probably would leave it for a month. It's the employee of the month, so I would. But if, if I've got content that I wanted to, to do less than that, then obviously I would change that date. So, so I'm just going to publish this. Uh, and then you should hopefully see it arrive on my screen shortly. And after that, then we'll just um, check to see if there's any uh, further questions. And then we'll be done. Um, so I'll go back to my dashboard. And um, I can see that my message is arriving. Uh, I think um, there we go. So. There's my Snapcoms Employee of the Month. So thanks, Mike. Uh, nicely done for your cloud migration project. And you had a lot of um, um, effort in there, but anyway, uh, so I just clicked got it and away I'm done. But hopefully that gives you some some idea of how easy we've tried to make. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of these, and we're just going to continue to keep building on these use cases um, uh, in terms of creation content. So th these have been a fairly fun type of use cases, but obviously you can see that we've got more serious ones, such as around compliance, policies, um, service disruptions, et cetera, et cetera, code alerts within healthcare. Um, you know, all, hopefully we, we'll provide uh, some good use case templates that you can use straight away um, without having to be particularly creative and, and make sure your communications look great. So with that, um, I will just flip back to the um, PowerPoint. Uh, let's just get, uh, here we are. And I think we should be back on there. I'll put my webcam back on. I'll move my PC and see if there's any we have further questions, questions coming in. We have questions coming in. Good. Okay. Sydney, did you want to take the first one? Yeah. So um, the first one is how can we best understand which channels um, are appropriate for each type of message? Um, I'll take that one, Mike, if you like. Sure. Okay, so, um, well, again, you'll get a copy of this deck and really start to look at, have a, have a look at that communication spectrum. I think that gives a great start in terms of, you know, okay, here are the types of things, the types of communications we have within an organization. Um, let's, let's start to look at, okay, how are we sending those types of messaging? Does it fit within that framework? Uh, it doesn't have to be perfect, but I think that, you know, for example, if you're, if you're sending, um, let's use an extreme, if you're sending, a, a, hey, there's a shooter in the building uh, or there's a fire in the building or something like that, so something that's really mission critical and you're sending that via email, then that's probably not the right medium. And I, and I appreciate that's that's obviously oversimplifying as well, but um, those are the types of things I would start to look at. What, what are communications am I sending in my, my organization and what is the medium that I'm using uh, to send them? And is that the, the optimum way to be doing that? Let's not just settle for, okay, well, that's what we've always done. We always send them that way. Let's start to look at how do we, how do we make sure that we maximize our responses? Hopefully that helps. Okay, we've got another question here. Um, I really have enjoyed all of this theory of psychology of communications, but I'm in a help desk. Our messages are simple and direct. How do you think this can be applied to our IT audits messages or cybersecurity warnings? Uh, Mike, do you want to do that? Yeah, sure. Um, I think hopefully from the examples that um, the Phil just showed before, um, it, it's pretty clear how you can how you can use some of these um, for IT related messages. Um, I think whether they are uh, messages where staff need to take action quickly, uh, so for service disruption, um, if they need to use a, an alternative system or something while one is down, um, I think uh, alerts or high visibility channels are, are effective for that. Uh, but then equally for um, 
for messages which require behavioral change like uh, cyber security. So um, taking employees uh, from sort of a level of understanding of cyber security which might be quite low or quite superficial through to exactly what they need to do. Um, educational campaigns uh, for that can be very effective. So screen savers and, uh, and those type of, uh, even digital signage if you happen to have um, big signage screens up in your, um, in your workplace. Um, so I think, yeah, I think any sort of environment really, uh, and IT particularly, um, can, can really make use of some of the, the insights we've shared today and apply them in, in your communication channels. Okay, um, we have another one. Uh, why did you put the HR messages in the lower left corner? Was there a particular reason or? Um, no specific reason that it's bottom left. It could be top left, could be um, other areas on the screen. Um, oh, I'm sorry, Mike, I was, I'll, I'll take this one. <laughs> um, uh, no particular reason, um, but what we what we do want to do is is build a dedicated space for that type of message. So, we, so it, you know, you start to build this message conditioning around, okay, well, in this area, he, these messages are likely to be around this type of topic versus, uh, for example, top right, and these are just how Snapcoms uses the product as well. So uh, versus top right for us, that is um, uh, used for you know more urgent uh, uh, notifications, so service disruptions and so on. So but, but we know that people will will start to associate that location based on the um, uh, based on you know the type of message it's likely to be. So and then people again start to react faster, it's more accessible, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So that's why we've differentiated it and put it in bottom left. But it doesn't have to be bottom left; it could be somewhere else. But it's that differentiation that we're trying to trying to get. Any other questions? If not, I will um, I'll end the show. We're, I think we're four minutes early, so hopefully you get a little bit of time back in your day. Um, I, if there are no other questions, then um, you know, look, it'd be great to receive any feedback that you guys can give us uh, in relation to, I guess, this topic and um, I guess how we're doing generally. So if there are any um, thoughts on that, then please drop them in the chat or or send them through uh, post uh, this um, this particular um, session. And um, so any any other questions, Beth or Sydney? Uh, no, that was it. Okay, all right. Um, Mike, did you have anything else that you wanted to add? Uh, no, but I think so. Just uh, thanks to everybody for joining. I know there's a lot of there's a lot of webinars out there these days, so uh, thank you for for joining us today. All right, um, great. Thanks everyone, and I think it's daylight for us now, Mike. So um, we've 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 gone through the uh, the door. Uh, Tiny anyway, lapse right. of the uh, light coming up behind me. <laughs> okay. Thanks everyone and uh, have a great uh, morning, afternoon or wherever or evening wherever you are. Appreciate your Thank time. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you.